Good morning. Welcome to the Pastor's Bible Class. I'm Pastor John, along with Pastor Nathan, and we're continuing our study on a season for everything. It's a study on the church calendar year, and we spent the last several weeks in Lent, and now we're going to go to the end of Lent and focus on Holy Week. Yeah. And so you'll know, uh, today we're going to focus on the first part of Monday, Thursday, and we're going to spend most of our time in what takes place in the upper room of Monday, Thursday. Next week, we're going to talk about in the garden right. uh, on Monday, Thursday. And then the two weeks after that, we're going to spend time focusing on the crucifixion of our Lord. And then we will end our study on the season of Lent in the church calendar year by focusing on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the beginning of the Easter season. Yep. Before we get started, just want to make a, a few opening comments. First of all, last week, I mentioned, I think in our discussion, yeah. that uh, someone has figured out that about 25% of all of uh, the Gospels deal with the last week of Jesus' life. Well, because I'm kind of a nerd, <laughs> I, I started adding up the, the chapters and doing some division. And actually, when you start from Palm Sunday until Good Friday, 27% of the Gospels deal with just that period of time in Jesus' life. One week. Yeah, one week. We're talking three years of ministry plus his early days, you know, his birth and that birth narratives, at least in the majority, in, the, in half the accounts, you've got that. And yet most of it, almost a third of the Gospels deals with a seven-day period. Yeah. Well, and if you include the resurrection on Easter Sunday, it jumps up to 31%. Yeah. So it is, it's almost a third. That you know, whole week, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's just packed stuff. And so we're going to be focusing today on what happens in the upper room of Monday, Thursday. But also on your study sheet, uh, I have a question. What is Monday, Thursday? We hear that a lot. This <laughs> Monday, Thursday. What is that, Pastor Nathan? Well, that's a gross misspelling of the word. <laughs> it's Monday, Thursday, M-A-U-N-D-Y, and it just means uh, foot washing or service. This is, this is in reference to the new command, the mm -hmm. mandatum that Jesus gives to his disciples, particularly John 13 and following, where he says, love one another. You yeah. know, As I love you, so you love one another. This is my new command, my new mandatum. That's right. And that's what, um, it's a Latin word, mandatum, meaning command, and it ties in with John 13, a new command I give you. So it's Monday, Thursday, not Monday, Thursday. <laughs> You're right. And it, it happens uh, literally hours before Jesus is crucified. Right. And uh, number three here, if we read Matthew 26, verse 20, what does this tell you about Monday, Thursday? Technically speaking, it's not Thursday at all in the Jewish right. calendar. Right. Because uh, the Jews go from sunset until the next day. That, that's when the day starts, is at sunset. Yeah. And so uh, Matthew 26, 20 tells us that in the evening, so after mm -hmm. sunset, Jesus met with his, the disciples in the upper room for the, uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Passover, and it technically then is all part of Good Friday, which right. I, I only meant to mention that not for trivia's sake, but it's a reminder of how jam-packed right. the last 23 hours of our Lord's life really was. It was incredible. Just the amount of things. You, you think about all the scenes that take place Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. You have the foot washing, the preparation of the, of the Passover meal, the foot washing, all the commands. You got four, as, as we talked about mm -hmm. beforehand, you got four chapters plus dedicated to just the upper room in John's gospel. Yeah. Then you have uh, the, the Gethsemane scenes, which are so powerful and so impactful among the gospels. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you have Jesus's, he's taken away to trial. He's falsely accused. He's false. He's, he's um, found guilty under false pretenses. He's Sent to he sent to Pilate and then to Herod and then back to Pilate yep. and then he is and then uh, he's beaten and then he makes the way to the cross and that's all by nine a.m. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There are technically five trials that Jesus goes through once he is betrayed by by Judas. He goes to Annas first, yes, yes. Uh, the former high priest, and then he goes to Caiaphas, who is the current high priest, then he goes to Pilate, then he goes to Herod, then he goes back to Pilate. <laughs> yeah, it's just. All of that happens by 9 a.m., yeah. and then he spends 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. by our, our time reckoning mm -hmm. on the cross. On the cross. Um, so this 
Maundy Thursday, what we would consider that evening going into Friday morning, so packed full of stuff. Yeah. So technically speaking, I said 23 hours. It's actually the last 21 hours of our Lord's earthly life before uh, he dies yeah. and is risen again on Easter Sunday. But we're going to break this study on what happens in the upper room into four parts. First, we're going to look at uh, John 13, mm -hmm. uh, 1 to 17. That's going to be the foot washing. Right. Then we're going to spend some time in Matthew chapter 26 looking at the institution of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk about, uh, go to Luke 22, which will be the focus on uh, Jesus reminding Peter that he is about to deny him three different right. times. Right. And then we're going to conclude with John chapter 17, which is Jesus' high priestly prayer. And again, this all takes place on Monday Thursday. Yep. So with that, I'm reading from the New International Version, the NIV translation, John 13, 1 to 17. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Mm -hmm. The evening meal was being served. And the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. When he came to Simon Peter, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? <laughs> Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Yeah, lots of stuff here. We're going to focus specifically on the foot washing. And just so you'll understand, because a lot of times we read the scriptures from our vantage point. You know, it's not mm -hmm. as if the disciples took off their Adidas or their Nike or their, or their marching boots so that Jesus could wash their feet. They walked around in sandals right. on dusty, dirty roads. Right. And so foot washing was a very messy business. And the CEOs, the executives, right. the high-powered people did not wash feet. Except, here, the God of the universe right. humbles himself to wash the feet. So, you know, Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, and he tells them, you don't get it right now, because Peter's, mm -hmm. you know, balking at it. This is, this mm -hmm. is not right, Lord. You are too important to do something like that. This is what Peter does, though. I mean, if, you, if you've been with us through the last few weeks in the Bible study here, Peter is like, no, Lord, this shall never happen to yeah. you. No, Lord. This was um, Matthew chapter 16 where he says, Lord, you know, you will never die on a cross. Lord, you'll never wash my feet. You'll never be my servant. Yeah. You're the master. I'm the servant. You know, I wash your feet. And Peter just kind of does this over and over and over again where he just kind of gets things he, he sees them from the world's perspective. Exactly. But Jesus has come to turn things on their heads yeah. a little bit. And it's like, well, as you said, first will be last, last will be first. Yeah, and, and Jesus teaches that throughout the Gospels. If you want to be great, 
you got to be the servant. Yeah. If you want to be first, you got to be last. It's those who are humbled that are exalted. It's those who are full of themselves yeah. who are brought down. Yeah. And Jesus didn't just teach it. He lived it yeah. um, in this. And then we're going to see specifically how he really washed us uh, even more fully the next day. Right. Yep. So. No, that's right. And this is where I look at this and I, I think about how the disciples, they would understand this. Um, they would understand this only because the Lord gives them the Holy Spirit later on. Yeah. And it gives them otherworldly wisdom to understand how, oh, that's what he meant when yep. he said this. And actually, in John's writing this, it's interesting, John's the only one who records this of the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. And John's writing from a different perspective. Um, and, and if you've been following us, you know we've mentioned this a few times, but John's perspective is more like, okay, you guys have the solid foundation of the three synoptic gospels. I'm going to write this, this kind of like overarching, here's, what's, here's the next level of meaning yeah. that's going on here. And he's writing from the perspective of, and we got it, but later. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like we, we didn't understand what he was saying. We were right there with him, and we didn't get it. And, and so, and he's writing to people who may have, you know, the church is starting to flesh out its theology. And yeah. so he's starting to, like, we didn't get it, but now we do get it. And oh, by the way, it's all about being humble and loving your yeah. neighbor and serving them. <laughs> well, and, and what's interesting, uh, according to Luke's gospel, after Jesus washes their feet, there's a dispute that arises yes. with the disciples. And the question is not who gets to wash feet next, it's who's going to be the greatest? They just don't get it. I mean, it is laughable no, how, how far you know, off they could be. You know, it's funny. You're thinking they're just sitting at this table, and Jesus is like, guys, I'm going to die. I'm within <laughs> like 12 hours of being crucified here. And they're kind of looking at each other going, so when Jesus is king and he's reigning in David's palace, who's going to be his number two man? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how they look at it. And they're just like, no, they missed it entirely. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And that wasn't the first time that they asked that because the other Gospels say, you know, it was on the way to Jerusalem that they had this discussion. Yeah. Uh, but they also had that discussion that same night yeah. after Jesus washes their feet. <laughs> yeah. no, they no, just no. don't get it. And, so, and, and, and neither do we. We often think that, yeah. you know, if, if you're a leader, if you're um, out front, other people get to serve you. Uh, I, I mentioned to Pastor Nathan that, when I was working on my, my doctorate at Fuller, the, I had a class on leadership, and the professor said that when he had a class on leadership for his degree, there was only one question on the entire final exam, and it was, what's the janitor's first name? Yeah. You know, the whole point being, we've been talking about Christian leadership, we've been, you know, struggling with what it means, but... Do you put it into practice in your life? Because too often we walk by the janitors. Right. You know, we're the people that are going to be something. And I, it, just, it was something that uh, I, I still remember him saying because it's a powerful lesson for us. So um, there's a lot more that we could say about this event, but we're trying to get through a lot of different things in the upper room. So let's go to Matthew chapter 26, if you'd read that for us. So this is starting at verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take it, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, This for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine. Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Pastor John, this is a packed subject yeah. Yeah. when it comes to uh, our kind of little corner of the, of the faith, but also the faith in general. And this is a massive thing that Jesus has done here, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, it is. It, it is the whole... The institution of the Lord's Supper, which is tied to the Passover, and we, and we can't miss the significance right. here. In the Passover feast, the lamb was slaughtered, mm -hmm. and blood was put on the doorpost and the lentil, so that when the angel of death came through the land of Egypt, it would see the blood, and it would pass over those who've been covered by the blood mm -hmm. of Christ. And that's the context for the institution of the Lord's Supper. Right. And it's during the Passover meal, he takes the bread. Yeah. And he makes an incredible declaration, mm -hmm. which is? I, this is my body. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's almost like John 6 where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. It, it really is all about him. As he says in John's gospel, you study the scriptures, that's the reference to the Old Testament, yeah. and they're all about me. Right. Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the true Passover lamb. And his body is, is given to us. His blood is given to us in, with, and under this thing called the Lord's Supper. In, with, and under the bread and the wine. It's so much more than what meets the eye. Right. There are a lot of people who say, well, it can't be, and so they just ignore it. But we really believe that Jesus knew what he was talking about yeah. when he says it, not once, not twice, but it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, yep. that Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. In a supernatural way, it's so much more than some bread and wine. Even in John chapter 6, John doesn't, gospel doesn't put this as a part of the... Um, the upper room scene, but he does make reference to it in John 6, where yep. he says, where, where he records Jesus saying, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have a part of the eternal kingdom, yeah. essentially. I'm paraphrasing there, but that's the idea. I mean, the, all of the gospels and First Corinthians all touch on this. Jesus says some crazy outlandish things. I mean, that's what you talk about this part A here. And that is what is unique about this supper. Yeah. It is, um, it is wholly un, unlike anything else in the history of the world. Yeah, and I can understand why people don't believe in what we call the real presence, because it just doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, even John 6, all of, like half of Jesus' yeah. like many of Jesus' disciples walk away. Yeah. When Jesus makes that statement about, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they're going like, You're, this guy's crazy. Yeah. You know, you, we gotta, we're, we're out of here. Yeah, we See can't ya. be doing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, if we don't, Jesus says we have no part in his kingdom. Yeah. We, we talked about this in the staff meeting today. In 1529, Martin Luther was meeting with the Reformed Church because they were pretty sure that they were going to be attacked by the Holy Roman uh, Empire, yeah. uh, the popes and his armies. And, and it turned out they later were yeah. uh, after Luther's death. But they were trying to get the reformed armies and the armies of, of Germany mm -hmm. on the same team, basically, right. so that they would have a better chance of fighting off uh, the, the enemy. And they <laughs> have this thing called the Marburg Colloquy. There are 15 articles. Yeah. I was doing some research since our uh, staff meeting. And they're doing really, really well. Yeah. Everything, okay, we can agree on this, we can agree on this, we can agree on this. And then it gets to the 15th article, and it's about the Lord's Supper. Yep. And the Reformers saying, well, it's not really the body and blood of Jesus. It just and represents it the just body. It just represents it. And Jesus says, no, it really is. I, yeah. I can't sign this. Yeah. And Achen Lampadius, he's a guy who's mediating the conference, he gets really mad at Luther. And he says, you are a, a stinking carcass of a man. Um, I can't believe that you were going to let all this <laughs> yeah. fall off apart just on one word and luther comes back by saying unless you can show me from the word of god yeah. that is does not mean <laughs> is i am bound by the word of god and it goes back to does jesus know what he's talking about right and we say yeah we can't explain how it happens mm -hmm. lutherans have never tried to explain how it right. is the body of christ and how it is the blood of christ but jesus says it is and what jesus says is what makes it what it is. Our faith does not make the sacrament what it is. Faith receives it, right? but it doesn't make it what it is. Jesus' word makes it what it is. And so uh, in, in this unique supper, it's so much more than what meets the eye. That's the bottom line that we want to stress here. Yes. And it's in the context of the Passover, which is just packed with significance. Because in, in the Old Testament, the greatest saving event... In, in, in the Old Testament, is the Exodus. Yes. You see it being talked about all the time from the prophets and in the Psalms. Yep. They go back to, hey, look what God has done for his people. Yep. And it's in that context that Jesus says, you know, the Passover lamb is right before you, the ultimate Passover lamb who sheds his blood and gives his, his life for you to eat and to drink so that you will have the forgiveness of sins right. and eternal life, which leads us to the next question. So what is given to us in this incredible supper? A lot. 
Yeah. It, there's a ton that's given to us, um, but just just some three things the, the, to get started on, at least from Matthew's, the Matthew text that we just read. We're given forgiveness of sins. Um, we're, we're in the middle of a sermon series right now uh, during the recording of this, this return to the Lord. And in the Lord's Supper, we return to the Lord. Yeah. We return from our ways, and we acknowledge that we were wrong when we go astray, when we follow our own path and stop following Jesus and what he would have us do. In the Lord's Supper, we are forgiven and we, we return to yeah. the Lord. There's reconciliation there. Yep, through, through what he says, this blood of the covenant. Mm-hmm. The second thing, though, is as you were pointing out, we're tied into a history that's longer than just um, the last 2,000 years. We're tied into a history that goes all the way back to the first Passover because Jesus says, this is the new covenant. This is the new, uh, and I'm the new sacrificial lamb. I'm mm-hmm. the new... Um, this is the new, the new people that you're being grafted into, but it ties back to the, uh, the God who keeps his promises yeah. from roughly 1450 B.C. all the way to 2021 A.D. and until Jesus returns. The same God who kept his promises then keeps his promises now and will keep his promises. And so we're tied into this incredible covenantal promise yeah. that's so huge. And that covenantal promise then ties us into verse 29. I tell you, I will not drink it again, this is Jesus, again of this fruit of the vine until I, the day when I drink it new in my Father's kingdom with you. It points us to the future. Yeah. It says, someday Jesus is going to return, and if you go to Revelation, the marriage feast of the, of lamb, the lamb and his kingdom which has no end. This is, as some of our liturgy talks about, um, the foretaste of the feast to come. Yep. So we've, we're looking ahead. And so, so we've got both past, present, and future kind of represented in all of this, plus forgiveness of sins, yeah. which is awesome. Well, and, and I don't want to get too far off track, but the do this in remembrance of me, mm-hmm. the, the Hebrew word zakar really focuses on what you just said. It is past, mm-hmm. but it's past made present. We get to participate in what's going on here, and it looks forward to the future. Yeah. It's all in that one little word, but it, it, they're powerful stuff that reminds us that we're not detached from our ancestors. Yeah. We're not detached from what happened at the Passover or from the, the upper room or Good Friday. Mm-hmm. It's all that present reality that we experience right now that we are washed in the blood of lamb and we're made clean yeah and, and as you talked about is all this earlier this then connects us um, vertically with with jesus you know so we've got this connection with god through this meal this communion mm-hmm. if you will but we also have communion with the people around us yeah. with the saints right now you know who have gone before us right now and who have already gone and you know and have gone ahead of us into yeah. into the kingdom i mean there's this one body you know, we're united in this meal and this one, this mystical union of mm-hmm. the one body of Christ. And, and once again, we got to go back to how does that work? We don't know, <laughs> but we believe Jesus does. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's right. It comes back to trusting Him. Yeah, yeah. So, again, we could say a whole lot more on the Lord's Supper. We're just hitting a kind of a cursory uh, synopsis of some of the things that are taking place in the upper room, which leads us then to Luke chapter twenty-two, verses thirty-one through. 37. And again, I'm reading from the NIV. Jesus is speaking to Simon, and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, Now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. I I have this highlighted uh, for our discussion simply again because this all takes place in the upper room. Right. And, you know, we we dog Peter um, because sometimes, you know, he must have had a pretty good sized mouth because he kept on putting lots of shoes into it. (laughs) Right. Um, and I have no doubt that 
Peter was very sincere when he said, Lord, I am going to go to prison for you. Right. If I have to, I will die for you. Peter made some pretty, pretty big promises, as we have. Yep. And yet, how often do we fall flat on our face? And uh, the, the question that I just want us to ponder is Jesus knows not only that Judas is going to betray him, and that's mentioned earlier uh, in Luke's gospel, uh, or yeah, Luke 22, verses 20 through 23, but that within hours, Peter is going to deny him three times. Right. So what two predictions does Jesus make about Peter? So I'm looking at the text here. Jesus makes a couple predictions. One is that he's going to deny his Lord and Savior. Yeah. But the other one is that eventually he's going to be redeemed yeah. from that and that his faith will be strengthened for it. Yeah. Really cool. Well, and it just fits in so well with our theme for the midweek services, return mm -hmm. to the Lord. Yeah. Our betrayals, our denials, our sins are not final. No. And they're not fatal as the children of God. Because as you mentioned in our talk beforehand, Jesus was praying for Peter. Mm -hmm. Jesus remained there for Peter, even though Peter was not there for the Lord. Right. Uh, Jesus is there for us, even though we're yeah. not there for the Lord, because we fall flat on our face. We can make big promises, and then we confess the same sins over yeah. and over again. And yet, our sins are not fatal. They are not final as the children of God right. because of Jesus Christ. We have an advocate yeah. who is on our side yeah. and who is um, praying for us and counseling the Father to mercy and grace. Yeah. And the wonderful counselor, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Which leads us then to the last part of what goes on in the upper room of, of Monday, Thursday. You mentioned he prays for us. And so we're going to end our discussion by focusing on John chapter 17, commonly referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. And we talk about Jesus as prophet who speaks God's word mm -hmm. and is God's word mm -hmm. in the flesh, as the priest, the ultimate high priest who intercedes for his people, makes sacrifices and is the sacrifice, yeah. Yeah. and then as the king who rules heaven and earth. Right. This one, we're going to read sections of it. It's a somewhat substantial chapter, so we're just going to read portions of it, but we're going to refer to most of the chapter, too. So if you do want to pause and read through the whole section before we get into this discussion, you sure can. But we're just going to go through portions of this and then talk about it. John chapter 17, 1 through 5, 11 through 12, and 20 through 21. When Jesus had spoken these words, <clears throat> by the way, those words are powerful. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. This word is thlipsis, mm. and thlipsis is the idea of a crushing event, that you're going to get crushed. This, this you're not going to make it through this life unscathed, but take heart. I have overcome the yeah. world. And then he immediately jumps into praying to the Father. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And well, let's just stop right there. Oh, yeah, and yeah, then we, yeah. This is so cool. Earlier that week on mm -hmm. Palm Sunday, they were glorifying Jesus. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so often when we think of glory, mm -hmm. we're thinking, oh, wow, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be great. It's going to be warm, fuzzy feelings, and, and everything's going to be happy. What is Jesus talking about when he's glorifying? He's talking about the cross. The cross. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the consistent theme throughout John's gospel. Jesus is glorified when he, and, and reigns from this thing called the cross. Yeah. That's his throne because he reigns over all flesh and, gives, and, given, and is given authority for eternal life. And, and, and it's his throne because from the cross, because he hung on the cross, 
We have forgiveness. Yep. We can return. We have life because that's what the cross is all about. And everything Jesus did, he did for us. He didn't have to. Right. He and the Father and the Spirit could have lived for all eternity, rotating around one another, but yeah. he loves the people whom he has created from the beginning of the world. Yeah. And he saw what we had done through our rebellion against him, and rather than allowing us to perish forever... He does the unthinkable. He puts on our flesh. He becomes one of us in order to rescue us at incredible uh, cost to himself. Yeah. But it's through that that the Father is glorified because this is the Father's plan from the very beginning. And Jesus is glorified because when we look at the cross now, we don't see an instrument of death. Right. For believers, it's an instrument of life. life. Because we see how incredibly God loves each and every one of us. And, and yeah. through the sacrifice of Christ, we have forgiveness and life. Verse 11 through 12, then, Jesus then shifts a little bit here in his prayer. Um, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Father. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you gave me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of, the, of destruction, that the scripture may be fulfilled. You and I were talking about this earlier, how this in this prayer, a few hours before Jesus is, is falsely accused, tried, convicted, and then uh, beaten and crucified, we would have been thinking about ourselves. Lord, give me yeah. strength. Lord, give me courage. Lord, give me this. Lord, give, you know, there are a lot of prayers about ourselves. But Jesus spends out of 26 verses that's the, you know, folks who are smarter than we are have divided this portion of section mm -hmm. of scripture up. If the 26 verses of this section as it's divided up, only five of them Jesus spends on himself. Yeah. The other 21, as we're going to see also in part B, um, Jesus spends on his disciples. Um, and then he talks about another group of people here in just a little bit. But he switches to his disciples. Yeah. And it's not just that he knew he was going to die. People die all the time, and I don't mean to downplay that. Right. Um, but he dies the most horrible death imaginable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the pain that Jesus suffered in his death is unlike the death of anyone else because he died for the sins of the entire world right. he took the wrath of god fully that's that cup that he drank from and he drank it down all the way he took all the wrath of god upon himself so that we would never have to experience that yeah. unfortunately there are people who will experience it because they reject jesus christ as their lord and savior and they will right. die in their sin but Jesus died for the sin of the entire world, of all people who have been, who are, and will be. It's, it's incredible what he had to endure. The physical suffering of crucifixion and the flogging is one thing, but the spiritual suffering, just we can't right. begin to comprehend how much Jesus suffered for us. And yet his concern was not for himself, other than that he would be able to glorify the Father through mm -hmm. this and fulfill the plan. His concern was for the disciples. Right. I mean, we see throughout this prayer, and if you have, if you paused or if you've read through this section before or are reading through it now, you'll see he'll say things like, I pray that they may be one even as we are one. Lord, protect them. Yeah. You, know, you know, sanctify them in the truth. Yep. Your word is truth. It's just it's some incredible stuff that he's praying for his disciples. But not just the disciples right then, mm -hmm. as we're going to read about in just a moment. He also prays for his disciples upcoming. Yeah. Right? Uh, 20 and 21 says this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Through, you know, notice what he says there, through their word, their yeah. disciples, yeah. as they make disciples, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent and the significance of this is that Jesus is specifically praying for us. You and me. Yeah. yeah. He prays for me in this prayer. Mm -hmm. The God who has created all things before all things, knows all things, he is thinking of you right. as he is getting ready to go into the Garden of Gethsemane, our study for next week, to be betrayed and then ultimately uh, crucified. 
his thoughts are about us. You know, John, writing this later on, he's the only one of the, the gospel writers who records this particular mm-hmm. section of the upper room. But one of the things I think, the Holy, as the Holy Spirit is guiding him to write this, he is reminding the folks as, as they're approaching the end of the, tw- end of the first century, mm-hmm. guys, you're going to be tempted to, to splinter off and to be at odds with one another. Love one another. Yeah. The idea of, man, but, and we can still use that in the 21st century oh. as much as the first century, that we need to be reminded that our, we're supposed to love each other. Yeah. You know? Well, and we often view other Christians at times as the enemy because they're, they don't have the right doctrine. We're not the enemy. Our brothers and sisters in Christ who know Jesus Christ, even if they belong to a different denomination, are not the enemy. Right. They are people for whom Jesus died. I would go so far as to say uh, those who don't know Jesus Christ, they're not the enemy. Right. They're people for whom Jesus died. Let me get really radical. Muslims are not the enemy. <laughs> right. You know, Democrats, Republicans, they're not the enemy. Yeah. You know, we may be in different camps, but everyone on this earth is cherished by God to the extent that God would lay down his life for them right. so that they could be one with him and one with his body, the people of God. Which means like um, someone who is smarter than I am has said before if, you mean, we as followers of Jesus, there are really only two camps. There are those who know Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. and those who do not know Jesus Christ. He died for all of them and those who know Jesus Christ their job is to go tell other people about this guy named Jesus. Like he says in here, those who will believe on account of their word, yep. their witness. And, and to love them so that they get to experience the love of Christ yeah. through the body of Christ. Right. And I think it's interesting. You mentioned that before we get to the high priestly prayer, Jesus says, hey, in the world you're going to have trouble. But in, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. <laughs> right. We are here for a purpose so that those who don't know Jesus Christ might know Jesus Christ through us as we live out a life of faith, of love, yeah. and teaching, pointing people to this God who has come into this world to rescue us through his suffering, death, and resurrection. Amazing. Once again, just amazing how Jesus how, how Jesus can think about all of these things yeah. and have that as the forefront of his, of, in his mind as he's preparing to go to the cross. Yeah. Um, unbelievable. I mean, yeah, and it's unbelievable for us because we're self-centered people. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> but, but Jesus was completely and utterly selfless. Yeah. And it, it ties back again. Everything he did, it wasn't a terrible injustice or some... Uh, unforeseen tragedy he knew exactly what was going to happen to him and it was a part of the plan yeah. to rescue us yeah. so even though he's literally hours from being crucified he can still see the picture of what i'm doing i'm doing so that you could know my love for all eternity yep what a packed evening yeah what a packed and evening. and we've only hit <laughs> one half of it because this is all just takes place in the upper room next week we're going to continue the study of Monday Thursday with what happens in the garden of Gethsemane man come back for part two of Monday Thursday y'all next week have a great day in the Lord take care